it to that. I'm kind of driving to it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, great, come on in, Mike. Have a seat up here. I told you it wouldn't be a throne, but we'd have a chair for you. So we're all set. We had to persuade everybody to take the seat off the hot seat. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> I'm Tim Abel. Let's keep it really, really brief uh, because we want to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from the mayor. So, David? Uh, Dave Gardner, Boston Drive. Jim Younger, I missed my spot, but I just want to make sure everybody speaks up. We don't have remote mics tonight, but we do have Allison. webcam recording. So thanks. Thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, pick up for your work. Philip Rogers, I live over on Essex Street. Landon Blumquist, I live over on SX3. Talk really loud, really loud. Paul Beswick, I live on Broadway. Oh, Matt Seco, 178 Lothrop Street. Omid, I live right there. <laughs> Eugenie Roy, I live um, on uh, 239 East Josh Toxie, I live on 244 Lothrop Street. Melissa Raymond Reed, I live right here. David Cannavale, 208 Dodge Street. Uh, Karen Fogarty, 169 Lothrop Street. Can I also ask everybody here to sign in before you leave so we can keep being in touch? Uh, Bob McIntosh, Atlantic Avenue, many friends along the corridor. Uh, Rachel Cole, Atlantic Avenue. Oh, Susie, I live on Porter Street. Um, Blythe Hazen, 19 Abbott, right behind City Hall, uh, in Abbott and Endicott. Hi, Mike Cahill. Well, you started to. I, uh, yeah, I started. I'm Tim Abril, uh, resident here, and uh, we, we are a group of people who have had a number of questions uh, about this uh, proposed uh, elect high voltage electric transmission line. Uh, many of you have seen the questions that we asked, and we just handed out uh, a list of the questions along with the answers uh, that the mayor has given us so far. And I think that a good way to start. Uh, extra Anybody wants uh, yeah, we have some extra can. copies there. I think two, a good. Sorry, yeah. two more people didn't introduce yes. themselves. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's yeah. get them. Thanks. Allison. Rabbi. Oh. Allison, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Rabbi Allison Adler. I uh, live at 12 Kiddings Avenue and also Temple of Abraham. And I think you just came in. Um, oh, my name is Rich Tavin. I'm going to put this on the sign in order to go in Massachusetts. And you want to? <laughs> We're really introducing ourselves, and your timing is awesome. Perfect. I'm Hannah Bowen. Hannah, so there's a seat right here. Street. Awesome. I'm going to take that chair. And we could mention Hannah is a candidate for a city council at large. Rich, you are too, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are there any other candidates here? Just. And actually, do you want to, um, our camera person, do you want to just introduce who you are and why you're here? Uh, Mark Lehman from BevChem to here to record the proceedings. And you Thank live you. at where? Oh, 19 Palmer Road. I'm not in the way. <laughs> So I, th I think what what we'd like to do is to start by, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Mike, just reviewing the questions we had and what the answers are at this point. Yeah. That would be great. Sure. So um, how many of you have had a chance to look through the, the answers to the questions? I got them to, to Tim at around lunchtime today. Okay. Um, so... There was a group of you who got together the other night and, and put these questions together. So the first one is, will I pause or stop the project? Um, I think as, as you know, um, I don't have the authority to pause or stop the project. However, um, I've spoken, well, you want me to read the answer? I can read I think the answer you, and then we can just chat. I think you can explain what? the answer or read the answer and we'll chat about it. Yeah, why, why don't I read it since I, you know, I, I said, that's what I said. I have asked for and expressed clearly, clearly to National Grid that there needs to be a pause to allow for the, city, the city's third-party peer review of National Grid's EMF study. John O'Brien, that's the, the uh, actually rather new New England Vice President for Corporate Affairs for National Grid, has agreed that this pause is needed. National Grid also knows that they cannot work in our streets on this project until they secure an approval from the City Council called the Grant of Location. 
And as the city solicitor advised, I do not as mayor have the authority to unilaterally pause the project, but just again focus on the fact that there is uh, an approval by the city council needed before the project can move forward. So that's the first one. Do you, do you want to go one yeah, by one? Yeah, I think one? we might ask. Yeah. I think we might ask questions of, about yeah. that. If anyone has a question to follow up on that, the, part of the question was, uh, are, I, I guess we're interested ultimately in knowing whether you are willing to push to have this pause so that we can get the information that we need. Yeah, I mean, I already have. I, 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 I will say I've talked with John O'Brien. I think daily for the last 10 days um, and it's you know I've made clear to him and he's been really the point person on this for grid that a pause is needed both for you folks to have the chance to hear from and and, and you know ask questions of and communicate with and interact with the grid team which is next Wednesday right um, and I assume I, I, that's a wrong wrong word to use I'm thinking that you're probably going to have you're going to want to talk with grid about the EMF study, you're going to want to talk with Grid about the route and why the rail bed is was not ultimately their preferred route and why they didn't go forward with that to the DPU. And, you know, I'm not sure what else that conversation will encompass, but certainly all of that. Um, and, I, and they know that we need them to pause the project for that and for us to get the third party review done and, and then have the ability to, all of us, to meet with the third party review a consultant get a sense of what that shows and then and then see what comes next so you know John O'Brien did ask me the other day how long were the neighbors going to want the pause to you know to uh, well there are two things here right there's there's an extension on the right to appeal separate from pausing the project moving forward um, so to my mind this pause needs to be long enough for all of the questions to be asked and answered, the due diligence that you're looking for to be done. Um, separate, it wasn't one of the questions, but I know we have talked about it. Um, the ability to extend out the appeal deadline, which otherwise is on the 28th, which is next a week from today, right? And that would be the day after hearing from and meeting with GRID. Um, as I understand the process, Next Thursday is a date by which an intervener needs to express um, an intent, a desire, an interest in appealing, and then there's another 10 days to actually file an appeal. There's a pending question to GRID about will they, and we, we brought the question to them, will they, uh, are they willing to extend out the appeal period? And what they said is, we understand why you want to do it. We as GRID aren't going to ask for that, it needs to be an intervener on the project, and as I understand, there are two interveners, meaning people who, um, a couple of steps ago in the process, um, expressed concerns and a desire to be uh, officially heard as parties questioning or challenging the project. And I think you folks have talked with one of the interveners and are working with that person to actually go through that process? Yeah, so, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Of it's course. Great to have you here. Um, and it's great to see so many people from my neighborhood and beyond that coming. So we're really, really grateful. I have gotten to know a lot of people through this and it's just been a really special experience during a time where there's so much other stuff going on to feel so connected to everybody. Um, thank you. Um, I think that the one thing to just point out to everybody to make sure everyone understands is that National Grid doesn't have the right to grant an appeal. National Grid's a party, and so EFSB is the one that would be granting an appeal, and so there could be a motion for an appeal. We, there's no standing that we have. We didn't file as an intervener already. It would be a pretty hard thing to become an intervener now at this stage of the game. We'd maybe bootstrap onto a current intervener, and some of the interveners have raised some of the issues that we've, that we've already started talking about. But we're basically in a position where we, you're, you, you started this out the right way, which is that it's not just about EMFs, the, you know, figuring out whether there's a cancer link that is exposing us to, um, you know, harm. It's 
just in general that we have not been part of the process to the extent that we feel like we even know at this point, like a, you know, a week and a half in, what are all the things that we want to know? And so part of the pause isn't just to have the EMF study done, and so that's really not enough. Um, so filing an appeal and figuring out a basis of appeal, obviously we cannot do very well in a week, which is why we would want an extension. Getting an extension either means bootstrapping to an existing party, an intervener, or forcing our way in by showing that we did not have due process during this whole proceeding, essentially. And that would, that's a hard thing to do. And so we're trying to figure out whether we can do that. Um, the appeal is not the only thing that is possible for us to stop this. And so what we're, you know, part of the reason why we wanted to talk with you is because we do think that there's a chance that you might be able to stop it unilaterally. And that was the first question that the mayor just was answering was, can I stop this? And I have read the, the memorandum of agreement, which we call the MOA. And my read of the MOA is that 180 days, if construction hasn't started, after 180 days from the signing of that, the execution of that MOA, that you can renegotiate the terms of that MOA. And what, I, what I'm hoping to hear is that since construction hasn't started, um, we can make sure it does not start before 180 days, which we think is at the end of October in just a few days, and that we have the chance to renegotiate at least some of those terms. There's a couple of other pathways to stopping this, and I'm interested in talking about that, but I think for now, like that's that first question. And so I'm pushing back on you because you started out by saying, you don't think you have that authority. And my read, and I've consulted some other attorneys, their read is that you do. So I know you had the solicitor look at it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just wrap the first question and then we'll, we'll, cause that brings us to a later question, which is the MOA, right? So just to the first question, um, which was about pausing, right? So as I said, uh, you know, I, I've expressed to John O'Brien at GRID the importance of pausing for all of what's being talked about to be worked through. Um, he's expressed his understanding that that's really important and it's important for GRID to, to work with that. Now, the, the leverage that remains for the city, as I said in, the, in my answer, is GRID needs what's called a grant of location to open our street, to work in our streets. And that's something that the city council grants or refuses. Now, it's not typically a controversial issue when it comes before councils or, or, or boards of select people, but it, you know, I would, I would guess that they might have a hard time getting the votes for that right now. So that is a leverage that the city retains. And I think, I think GRID understands that as well as understanding that it's important that the community have this opportunity in this time. Then I mentioned the official appeal, and I just want to say that John O'Brien said that, that if an intervener brings a, an intent to appeal, or I'm sorry, if an intervener asked for the appeal period to be extended, that they would express support, they being grid. He did ask me how long would the community want that extension to run? So that's an open question. So now we'll turn to the MOA as you asked, Alyssa. Um, so when Jim brought it up at the, at the public meeting. Yeah, sure, sure. Get a clarification. So when would the city council actually vote on that grant of location? When would that happen? When GRID would file a request so that hasn't for a grant of location, not okay. yet. And actually, I, we, had, we heard a rumor, and it's a rumor, that they already waived their right to, that somehow the city council, maybe even not knowing, um, that this has already been voted on. And that's really critical to us to know. Do, this, do, do we still have a chance for the city council to not permit the opening of the streets? Yeah, I mean, that's nothing I know about. Um, I will take that question back. I have not heard of that, or that doesn't seem like it makes sense. Well, it might, it might be related to the, um, uh, the, zone, the uh, zoning regulations that they uh, petitioned to be made exempt from and that the city did not object to. 
that's one of the questions actually. Right. Okay. But, so but the low hanging fruit here is that we can write a letter or at least get in touch with our, our council right. members right away yeah. to confirm that this is a way to pause and put pressure on them to make sure that they act against it or essentially in favor of grant not granting. So I, I met with Councillors Hausman, Flowers, and Brand yesterday, yep. and you know they're they're you know rightly wanting to represent you best, and, and so we're we're trying to stay in contact regularly, and we talked about that piece of it, the fact that the council you know still has that authority to approve or reject that re, that grant of location. Um, again, Alyssa, I'm I don't I don't know anything about any waiver of that. I'm I'm going to check on that. It would, yeah, just a rumor. Yeah, that's it. That's fine. Folks, this is Jocelyn Ruel Kirsker. She's the chief of staff in the mayor's office. Jocelyn, we have some more chairs. Right there for uh, there. There's it's one okay. right there I next know. to Alyssa and Josh. Okay. okay. My husband was there, but he'll find Oh, the sorry. That's <laughs> okay. There's one right here. This is somebody's chair. Yeah. It was yeah. my husband. Jocelyn, what about oh here's, here's, here's one right here, Jocelyn. I'm very familiar yeah, yeah, yeah. with Mr. Abrams' yard. I can just sit down. Yeah, it's still better in front of Mark. Okay, here's one right over here. Oh, yeah. Am I going to block the camera? No. Okay. Nah. I'll move. Thank you. So the, the, the question that we should turn to next is that about that of the MOA. Number two, So, um, so as Alyssa said, the the read that the city solicitor has on the MOA is that that 180 days is intended to run from the permitting of the project. So, and, and again, I'm happy to follow up, Alyssa, with you and the solicitor or anybody else, but her read of it was when you read the language of the MOA in total, um, it, it obviously anticipated that there would be a period for permitting. The language of the MOA says they anticipate the permit in the window of April 2021. Now, we know that it didn't come until 10 days ago, 15, or whatever, 15 days ago. Um, so you could make an argument the 180 days would start to run this past April. Grid might make an argument, and I know they would, that it would, it would start to run just last week. And you're suggesting that we could successfully make an argument that it's it started to run upon the signing of the MOA. So I, I mean, I asked that specifically at the solicitor. Her opinion was that that would not be a, a an argument that we would win. Um, I reached out to Grid last week to say we want to talk with you about the MOA and about reopening it. And without without talking with us about it, their attorney immediately said. Um, the 180 days has a run, so they, you know they knew where we were looking. So I mean, we can talk further on it, but I, I, that's why I say, and, and you also know that it's not a unilateral thing. It's a one party can reach out to the other with a desire to open and, and, re, and renegotiate. The other thing about the MOA that I think is important, um, and, and this is how I understand it, is that the MOA didn't set the preferred route, which is that was Grid's term in their application. This is our preferred route. The MOA didn't set the route. Um, the MOA was about trying to mitigate or minimize impacts, assuming the route that they were going after. And so in, in that MOA, we, we negotiated for them to use the delta configuration for how to run the lines, which is meant to um, to minimize, to neutralize. I don't know what the right word is. It depends on, on I think, you know, there are different words used, but the point of the, the delta configuration of the lines is that that is meant to be a best practice, minimize any concern around public health. The other thing was to, is to try to ensure a certain uniform depth and encasement in concrete. Um, so those things were in the MOA, which are meant to accrue to this to the community's benefit um, just you know to have a sense of what's in there and why it's there. any any further thoughts or reaction on, on, on that 
Oh, go, sure, uh, no, go right ahead. Just a clarification. The permit was signed uh, 10, 15 days ago. What permit are you referring to? The, the application by National Grid to the state's elec the electric energy. facility siting board within the DPU, correct? It's the energy facility siting board. It's a separate agency. Okay. It's, so I should have put the case numbers on these because it's pretty they, they They had their public hearing on their application. And I think the final decision was dated October 8th yep. that approved it. Yes. Yep. And, and that permit grants them what right? It approves the project by, at that level on the in the in the way it was applied for it, meaning the route that was uh, that was sought. It doesn't, and that's what we talked about earlier. There's still a local approval needed for them to be able to go in the street and start work. Would that be a permanent solution, or would that be a stopgap measure? Um, I don't know enough about it. What the solicitor said to me is, if the council were to deny that grant of location, it could, you know, grid could respond by seeking relief in court against the city, and then there, you know, then there could be a, a process of, you know, legal process in court. I'd like to think that. You know that at that point, Grid would be wanting to work with the community, and I've I've expressed that to, to John O'Brien. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I can't tell you with any authority that you know what would or wouldn't happen at that point. I, that's okay. actually directly related to to my question. I've been thinking a lot about the the rationale for the um, the memorandum itself. I'm curious, Mr. Mayor, as mayor and in your knowledge of all the municipalities in in the commonwealth since you you've been mayor um how frequently if ever um is a utility that makes an application for a project like this where it um presents a necessary uh application necessary function and has its application <laughs> approved by the siting board, um, can that be resisted by the community? And basically asking, does the siting board's authority ultimately have superseding authority over the city? Can they basically compel us to put this in our community? I'm writing it down, Karen, because I need, I'm gonna need to go research that. Okay. Because I know um, a recent case, the town of Winchester sought to appeal a decision. Um, the town itself appealed the decision and did not prevail. Um, and that's upsetting. Yeah. So I'll look into that. I mean, that's, it sounds like two different responses. I mean, uh, um, a refusal to grant location, right, isn't a direct appeal of a of a of an EFSB decision. Sure. So I don't know how that would play differently. But right, but I, I but the the bottom line question is, does um, the Department of Public Utilities right. via its siting board have authority to compel the city to accept this transmission line? Part of that would be, in the best of all worlds, as you just outlined in number one here, if Mr. O'Brien of National Grid did allow the changing of the preferred route, which is written into the if, if EFSB's decision, would EFSB say, okay, you have to do another application, you can alter, you can change this, it's an addendum, but we would allow that. So not only would they not dig in to use whatever authority they have to make Beverly do what their initial decision says, but they would allow National Grid to make the change to the route along the railroad bed after we had conversations as an amendment. So the process could continue to go expeditiously, which is in everyone's right. favor if it's done correctly. I think, Jim, you're, you're, you're bringing up another major topic that we have, and it's one 
Mike, I know uh, Mr. Mayor, you and I have talked about this, is that we already know that we have a failed line along the railroad right of way. Uh, we know that they've used uh, uh, underground transmission lines that, uh, that had uh, transformer oil in them. It's a site that's going to have to be cleaned up anyway. Um, you've, you've mentioned that you wished in a way that you had pushed harder. I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But no, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Okay, you clarify that. But, but we do have an existing right-of-way that is complicated in some ways, but would not have the health benefits, to, uh, health uh, risks for citizens, uh, and would also not be as disruptive, although you'd have to deal with the MBTA. And, and I think a lot of us feel that with that existing right-of-way and the need to clean it up anyway, why are we not simply using what we already have uh, and then avoiding all of the risks that we would have? Uh, because the people that I've been consulting about this uh, have indicated that when you do underground transmission line, lines, they're very hard to determine when they're failing, where they're failing, uh, the repairs on them can be much worse than what we would have with a railroad right-of-way. Uh, and uh, are we adding another potential uh, place where there could be contamination rather than dealing with the current contamination? So could you comment on why we can't go back to the drawing board in terms mm -hmm. of the most uh, accessible, safest spot on the rail on the railroad? Sure. So uh, let me first just say, you know, I have no background in science, either science generally or EMF science. And, you know, I, GRID, they did their EMF study. We have a, a third party reviewer on board, and we can talk about the details of that in a little bit. And, you know, and so we need to see what comes back from that. Uh, I, I know there's a strong feeling here that you don't want it there no matter what. I, I understand that. Um, what Tim is saying is that I, I've expressed to Tim and a few other people, you know, we pushed hard for nearly a year for that railroad right-of-way route, and we kept getting pushed back, first by GRID and then by the MBTA, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, at a certain point, it seemed, there seemed to be, you know, too big a hill to climb to, uh, to get to the ability to run that, that new line up the rail bed. And so we turned our focus to trying to get the best possible design for construction, as I talked about with the configuration and, and, and how to, how to uh, uh, bury the lines and, and then how to try to make the, the roadways whole after the project. So we turned our attention to that. I mean, I would love to work with you and find a way to successfully get them to, to both revisit and, and, and turn the the project back to the rail line. I don't know if it's possible. I, you know, I, I, um, I'm happy to, you know, to get together with you and try to push there. Um, so, is, did that answer you on that, Tim? I, I'm not sure if I got everything. So, can I just say, yeah, that that hill you supposedly were fighting against the climb, yeah, has technically been overcome because National Grid is currently working with the MBTA right now. Which means they're willing to do it when they feel like it's necessary. They should be willing to do it when the fit city feels like it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, I, I appreciate the point. Um, do you want me to go to? Because you asked in one of the questions um, if I could explain the the details around what's in the real bed and what the arguments they were making were. Do you want to go into that a little bit or so, not? Yeah. So part of their arguments was time working between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m because of safety concerns. But right now, they work all day long. The train has to sound its horn. It goes like five miles an hour. Was the option of using buses ever brought up? Yeah. They, they overcame that, that hill by themselves when they had an accident six months ago. Yeah. And, and they're still doing it now. So their pushback seems to be irrelevant. They're willing to do it when it's convenient for right. them. But I would say the hours of operation and the, the problem, I mean, none of that really spoke to me so much. Um, the and, and, and I was also asked, you know, can't, can't they do some of the things you just mentioned? Of course they can. If you remember when 
when we had to get the rail bridge repaired, specifically the, the, the swing span. Yeah. And for what, for about a summer, I think all, most or all of that summer we were busing. So, uh, you know, yes, they can and they have. And I, and I think what you're referring to is the work they're currently doing to try to get that broken line back up and running to give us back the redundancy we need for the period, for the, in the meantime. Um, so the things that, the things that they, that they presented and, and listen, they're going to come and present them next Wednesday and, you know, and, and, you know, let's challenge them. When I was challenging these and, and, and I, well, this is, this is what I know on the right hand side of the rail bed going northbound is the overhead line. Also on the right hand side for a, a section, part of the length between, but we're really talking about from where the, where the line comes off the railroad bridge or off the traffic bridge. I don't know which There's one it lines is. lines on both sides. They're, um, you know, they, they, we're talking about from there up to the East Beverly Station, right? And, and it, it, it hits the River Street substation and then it's up to East Beverly. Part of that stretch downtown, we have uh, stormwater drainage infrastructure of the cities that runs under a street and then hits the railroad and runs down the railroad and then peels off. So part of our part of that stretch on the northbound right hand side, there's that. Overhead there's the, the, the main line, the, the, the primary line. And underground there's for a certain part of the stretch, there's also a 23 kV line, a smaller line that's more local. And I've got a I've, I've got some notes about trying to get better understanding of just where that comes from, where it ends, what it does. On the left hand side going northbound is the existing failed line. So the things that they said were um, working on the, on the left side with the failed line and trying to put the new line in, is there enough right of way? They suggested there wasn't. In 2021, the technology required is different than when they laid that line 50 years ago. The um, man, manholes that you, you folks heard referred to in the meeting that are significant size, they've got to go down in the ground every roughly 1,500 feet of line. Um, there's there's a, a question of, and they were saying that it wouldn't fit. And I don't know what, if that means it would require some, some of it go under an existing piece of the rail line, or if it goes out of their right of way under private property that they don't own and so forth. So those are some of those things. They talked about the right-hand line with the overhead and the inability to bring the cranes in that would be needed without running the risk of knocking out the, the primary line. So those are some of the things that, that were put in front of us. Um, but again, you know, I've told them they're going to need to put all that in front of you folks and, and me, but, you know, especially you folks next Wednesday night. And, you know, I can, uh, we did share with you last, whenever, last week, and we can share um, the rendering that they, you know, that we're able to, that cross-section we had in, in terms of trying to prepare to refute all that next Wednesday night, if, if that makes sense to you folks. The manhole casements are used to access and work on the infrastructure in case there's problems. If they need access, is that why they're going to put them in along the Why are there manholes every so many feet? I, I, I don't know. Because one of the conduits yeah. would be for a future temperature monitoring system, which again, is they, they're going to have a blank conduit. And what we should, if they're going to, you know, theoretically do this, they should have um, the temperature monitoring in there. It's interesting that they're going to decide not to do that now and maybe put it in at a later date. Um, that seems like a safety issue in itself. But again, I guess you said we'll answer this next week. Um, well, it sounds, Josh, like you're, you're asking, you're asking, in some sense, about the utility or the need for the manholes. Yes. Uh, yes, because if you, if you bring that up for the train bed, I yeah, I guess that is a clarification. I wasn't okay. aware of that. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure those manholes are sectioned like that, so if they have a breakage, yes. they can access not the whole line, but access right. 15 and replace. But if my understanding is that we don't know where those are. Um, we haven't seen any drawings that show that. Yeah, I mean, they know how many, on the route that they, they applied for approval on, right, they, they know how many they need, roughly, because it's based on every 1,500 feet. 
have they laid out exactly where they're going to go? I, 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 let, let me, let me. Right <laughs> going to go right in the fire. <laughs> And they're the size of the school bus, correct? Yeah, you know what's happening right now that I just want to um, make sure that we can um, acknowledge is that last week when we met at the senior center, we were, as you mentioned oh, wow. there, um, focusing a lot on health impacts and mm. people were very scared about that. And, and you heard that. Mm -hmm. And the immediate action that has happened is that you have hired or started or put in a uh, potential contract for services for an EMF expert. I think that, as I said before, we are starting to learn a lot more as we're digging around and starting to educate ourselves. And I think it's what you're hearing now in all these other concerns in addition to the EMF exposure. So I would actually like to just pause and make sure there's a few people here who have gotten in touch um, about who have who have been asking some questions, and I think it's a it's already happening, but just to make sure that you hear, and again, we're, I just want to say we're really in the beginning of this, and we are citizens, not experts, right? Just as you said, you're not a scientist, but can people continue to say what it is that they are worried about so that the mayor can hear that? Because it's not just anymore the EMF, and that means that having this expert come in at 2,000 or 20,000 or whatever the contracted services are, whether it's independent, not independent, is not going to be enough. So I want to make sure you hear that. I want to make sure people have the chance to say. You want to moderate? Yeah, yeah Bruce, do you want to? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, can we get a copy of the EMF report that, uh, yeah. before this meeting? This week? Ab absolutely. Some of you have already seen it. It, it. In their application, in their application to the EFSB, it's, it's is part of their application. It's roughly about 140 pages. I think it's like from page 29 to 179 in the application. If it hasn't, we'll make sure that it's linked on our website. It is linked on National Grid's project website, which has a very cumbersome long name. Um, what is it? Beverly Reliability Transmission Project. But, but I will make sure that um, that it's linked on our website, and I'll work with Tim to make sure that you've got easy access to, to looking at it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, back there, Rich, is it? I just have a, I'm not a scientist either, but I just have a question, like it's kind of off the wall question. Did they put it offshore? Did they, they put they, it they, offshore? Did they, they put the, uh, the ocean they put it on the shore? I would imagine maintenance would be a nightmare. <laughs> uh, Rich, it's not something that's been brought up to this point. Okay, I, I was talking to President today, and that was his suggestion. When I was campaigning today, they said that maybe we put it offshore. Sure. Eric? Yeah, if, if you did, you'd still need to come back. You know, say say you went off the rail, the, the bridge and went around, you'd still have to come back on land at some yeah. point to get over to the East Beverly Station, but you'd still have to go under some... You know, whether it be roadway or off-roadway. It's interesting. Let me jot it down anyway. Uh, let's go ahead, Eric. I am a scientist, uh, but I do have a non-scientific question about this. And that is, you know, we've seen the, uh, the cross-section of the, rail, the railway and, the, and you heard some of the arguments on why not in the roadway. Mm -hmm. We're not in the railways right away. But um, as you know, I've seen on this map here, you know, there's a lot going on, at least even on this section of road, right? right. And I haven't seen any, any information on how the, this new line, if it does end up going down this road, how that interplays with all the other utilities that are already there, right. potentially interferes with it. Um, have they presented any information like that? Yeah, I don't know how, how um, close to 100% that design is. You're right, there's a lot of infrastructure under really every road. Um, I do know that they, you know, if they, were to, if they were to build out the way they've got it, they would not be coming down the center line. They'd be on one side or the other more than in the center. Um, I'm gonna make a note because I don't know if there's, if there's something on paper that shows yet. 
There actually is. They filed um, on the 14th, uh, added to the docket. It was a uh, requested item as part of the approval. And I, I think we've got it on the... He's, he's actually seen it, so he's yeah, speaking yeah, from right. a place of... Well, I've, I've seen like the overview, like this is maybe where, where potentially a conduit could go or where they would at least block off for construction. But I don't know how that interplays with everything else that's already there. Does we, it go we, above yeah. it, below it? Yeah. You know, do things get disrupted? How long do they get disrupted? We, we have here, we know we have a brand new gas line that was installed here. We know that we have the water line. We know we have the sewer line. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the water line is hooked up to all of the, uh, the hydrants. So we've got, we have a very, very busy street. And when the gas company did it, they moved around some trees, so there are some uh, little bow-shaped uh, moves. So we're kind of wondering about that. But I do want to get back before Aunt David. I know you want to say something, uh, but before we get back to that, Alyssa said, "What are what are the the concerns that right. we have?" So there there is of course the concern about the electromagnetic radiation and the correlations to health concerns. There's another concern which is significant, and, and it doesn't matter whether electromagnetic even is true. People believe it's true, and there could be a huge impact on property values for everybody along the way. Because if you all of a sudden know now that you're that the house is exposed to electromagnetic uh, radiation, it doesn't matter whether the science is true, as long as the people have the perception you have a significant drop in property value. And I think that's that's a secondary concern for those of us that are concerned about the kids in the neighborhood. Um, so we have, we have that, that kind of concern, but one thing that we've tried to say all along is this is not a not in my backyard movement. We're not people that are against progress. We know that we need to replace that line. We are just concerned about how do we do it and how do we do it in an environmentally safe way that would include cleaning up some of the disaster we have on the right of way right now and installing something that will be safe and will lead us into the future. There's no doubt the project has to be done. So when we say stop or pause, we are talking about the current plan. We're not talking about, we don't, we're not telling our friends in Gloucester and Rockport and Manchester they can't have electricity. <laughs> we know they have to have electricity, but they don't want to do it on the backs of our kids. And they certainly don't want to do it in a way that will now cause ratepayers to all of them to pay a whole lot more money. But we're worried about that impact too. I know. I think that's answering Alyssa. That's my personal feeling about it. One of the reasons I've got. Yeah, involved. there were a few things that I saw over the last few days that were, um, and that was beautiful. Yeah, you said very it beautifully. Well um, um, that are just very specific. And so, I mean, I'm. I don't remember it all. So I know that, I know Dave had his hand raised. I know that there are people who have looked at ratepayer issues. I know that there's people who have looked at leakage and the kinds of materials that are being wrapped around um, the line itself um, and the challenge of knowing when it's leaking. So how do you know when it's leaking? Um, I'm, I'm literally repeating from my memory what I can. If people can chime in and, and the, help me with that. The concern that the intervener, Mr. Brown, who um, owns the property on Weber Avenue, raised was really alarming. And that has to do with the proximity of this cable, um, which will be placed, I believe, 12 inches from the main gas trunk line that's also running down Weber Avenue and questions about whether that's safe. And Dave brought up copper. Do you mind yeah, sharing Dave, about that? Yeah, Dave's, Dave's a plumber. He knows infrastructure. Uh, we have a couple of plumbers at least here tonight. So a, foot, a phone call comes right at the front. Um, I'd like to just say that I've been a resident of Beverly my whole life. And I've been in a lot of I've tied into a lot of uh, city lines through the city streets and stuff. There's a lot in the city streets right now. You have you have gas, you have water, you have uh, sewerage, and uh, trying to put a, a, a school bus every 15 feet inside the street that's going to be a really tough thing. And and like Alyssa said, um, <coughs> we have water going into every single house in the city, and it's all copper. And it's all a great conductor of electricity. 
what happens if something ever fails in, in the street? Yeah. And that electricity comes into your house. We have no fail safe against it. Yeah, the bond on your water main is not going to save your life. Correct. Yeah. So, so I just I lines. just wanted to say that also. I, I really don't think it's a safe project. I don't know. But that's just my opinion. Can you tell me a little bit about, you told me earlier today about the clipper ship in Salem that has the high tension lines over the top of it? Oh, yeah. Now that you can't put, you cannot put fluorescent lights into that building because, yeah, because the lights just flicker that because they're yeah, affected they, by the, the, the mercury electrode. inside the fluorescent bulb actually activates yeah. the, the fluorescence inside the bulb right. on the second floor of that. Yeah. That's why you go LED. So, <laughs> well, but that, that also raises the point, like, if the electro, if the EMF interferes with communication signals, anyone who's working from home, um, like, we rely on reliable internet, right, to work from home, and people rely on telephone lines, like, is there any recourse if, if we have issues from EMF field? So the question is, if, if it gets built the way they the way they've permitted it, what? do you do you have to be concerned with 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 your ability to work from home and it interfering with Wi-Fi or it's, it's with more the EMF studies that we've talked about right now are very focused on health, but there is also the like, is the study looking at things like is it going to interfere with internet signals, yeah. with cable signals, with Wi-Fi signals? Not just work, but um, schooling as well. In no. the event that we have two virtual schooling, and will that be for all of them? Eric, go yeah. ahead. And, and anybody else? Sorry. If I'm not, well, no, no. Thinking, this please. is totally piggy piggybacking on that, but yeah. also tying back medical is that there are also lots of medical devices that aren't supposed to be around, i.e. the environment fields, uh, that also work, and some of them are broadcast and have, have Wi-Fi signals that, you know, that's interfering, that's a problem. I personally have a medical device that um, I can't be near, like, I can't go through like metal detectors and things like that. So if levels are anywhere close, then well, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Um, uh, it's a big problem. And, I actually have questions out to some medical device suppliers, including the one that I that, that my device is from, to find out about exactly what their restriction on this and stuff like that. Because I can't be the only person on the yeah. entire route without the issue. I'm just going to stick my, my neck out here too and say um, I think this goes back to we're still on question one <laughs> and. Um, whether there's the authority, what is your authority to renegotiate the terms of mitigation in the MOA? And as you said, um, you can unilaterally ask to do that. And if we can create a basis for you to do that with all of these concerns, including literally one-offs, you know, there might be specific situations, but they are aggregate concerns when you pull them. And I don't think the MOA, as it reads now, does adequately mitigate the concerns that we are raising tonight. So, so is it fair to say that the neighborhood's first goal would be to reverse the route and place it on the rail line? Yes. Okay. I think we wanted another neighborhood. Like oh, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. You're right. That's not a good answer is to say another, another route also under street. It, 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 so, if that's successful, then what you're discussing as concerns would really be moot. And so the need the need to revisit the, the open the MOA. In fact, at that point, Grid would likely want to reopen and, and eliminate the payment for paving, right? Yes, of course. So, um, so I, I I got a sense that the questions around reopening the MOA initially were we're about trying to find an end to slowing things down or pausing things. But I think we've got the ability to pause without trying to reopen the MOA, which again, just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like an avenue that we can su successfully travel right now. I mean, look, I'm, I'm willing to exp explore it more with you, Alyssa, and, and you know, get more legal minds looking at the same document. I mean, you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. I, I, I only read it you know, as somebody who pays my dues every year but doesn't practice law. Yeah, right. I'd rather not have to litigate. Yeah. I'd rather figure yeah. out how to align right. and stop it and reroute it in a way that brings the electricity that we need 
they're gonna go somewhere. Um, so I, I, I was distraught to see that the that the that the determination seemed to hinge on the failure to play ball with the MBTA and you know between N National Grid and MBTA, mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous to me that we then have to bear all of these uncertainties and risks, mm -hmm. um, and we can avoid that. And I think that we, I'm concerned that we've missed that window, or that it's, we're at a much harder stage to try to, to try to do this now, and I'm really trying to figure out what are the procedural routes to moving it. So pausing it is just allowing us to do that research and figure that out. It's allowing us to research and get legal advice. But if we can be doing that together and, and figuring out um, if there is alignment, knowing that there might not be, or that I recognize the city has its interests that might not always be aligned, um, I want to know that. And then to make, you know, and then for us to be able to make a decision about whether we're going to spend money on council and, and going forward with this. Can I add something to that? So we want to help you basically change National Grid's mind. Yeah. And if you look at sort of historically what the EFSB has done, what all these other lawyers have done, you know, it's sort of like your parents saying, as a parent, you say to your kid, oh, when you get to be my age, you'll understand. In this case, oh, it's when you get to be a professional and you know how to put something down a railroad track, you know how electricity works, you'll, know, you'll understand. We already know from the four points that are in the study that we can refute all of those. But would it help us to help you if we can get somebody like Dewberry that created the drawing, somebody, an elect, you know, a, a construction contractor who's built, you know, I don't know, some major projects to sit there while National Grid is telling us, oh, you can't go down the railroad tracks. And them saying, oh, well, you can take this XYZ crane and actually get the small one that's on this side. So, you know, there's a way to actually approach this. Do you want an independent construction study? I'm just saying we want to help the mayor basically persuade National Grid if this is really what it's about. I mean, there could be other reasons that are political beyond us. But if this is really what it takes to convince National Grid, we know at least two points. One, that line is dead now. That underground line is dead. When they initially put this proposal together, they wanted to have redundancy. They wanted to keep that line alive. They couldn't work in the same right away. Now it's dead. Two, they said that the federal government had a positive track program going, which was supposed to finish by 2020. It's done now. Uh, the, other, the other ones are more technical. They have to do with um, the amount of room in the right of way for uh, the slope of the, the sheeting they want to use and uh, the, some of the butters that are there. Um, but they also actually talk about putting a second line overhead, which would be incredibly, you know, another very inexpensive way of doing things. So the point is, we want to help you get to that point where we can persuade them, and then we can avoid having to litigate. We can avoid yeah. having to change anything in the MOA other than just renegotiating the terms that go with this other plan. Thanks, How Susie. would putting another overhead line with a high voltage line be yeah. less um, how would we be less vulnerable to that than because a 10 where, foot underground? Where it's located. Tubes? It would be essentially where it's located because well, the. the oh, no, I was going to say, like, technically, I, I get where you're going because it's, it's, um, it's protective for community, but not the electric, like power redundancy, right? Yeah. yeah, it's also vulnerable to be knocked over by a storm, too. But I think we're talking about different voltage levels. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, I don't know the answer to the question. So, see, yeah, I think uh -huh. rationally, it sounds like, you know, you're not going to have two overhead lines because, well, one underground is in a different route than the other one. It's like having, the you know, uh, vice president. But, but I think the technology, I think it's still worth asking. Why did they even oh, explore God, yes, it? Oh, God, yes, it's worth asking, The technology yes. is different. And one thing I can tell you, I've looked at those, those posts down there, you know, those, tele I don't even think, towers, right? Yeah. Those towers are pretty much, the top line is above any tree I've ever seen in the city of Beverly. So I'm just wondering if underground line and overhead line is apples apples what the lines are. Good question. Yeah. I, don't know. I think one of the other mm -hmm. issues that um, National Grid claimed was that the 
the right of way in the rail bed, yep. um, MBTA has a, it's a revocable right of way. And they claimed that um, MBTA has the authority to revoke that at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like just renegotiating the terms of the right of way. Yeah. So that, that can't happen. Yeah, who is the MBTA? Because I can't imagine that, um, I mean, the whole idea that they could put this in our streets and we wouldn't have any recourse to tell them to move it. We would give them a, a, a right of way in perpetuity, but the MBTA can't. I, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't make sense. I'd like to just say, too, that I know, and I'm not a scientist, and then I don't know, I understand there's problems with putting a new line in the existing, um, just like hearing that wide enough, but you know, maybe there could be a redesign or maybe making it work. But it seems to me though it's really it would be more efficient that if the existing line has to come out anyway because of fraud. Doesn't it make sense that while it's being taken out a new one can be put in? And it's you know, that seems kind of efficient. If I could, Eugenie, that that's a good question. Actually all the points are being made, I really appreciate them and, and Jim your thinking, yes. I mean, I, I, I want to I want to see what we can accomplish together on trying to change their mind. On on the um, on the question about the existing line that's not working, they're saying that their target date to have it back up and running for redundancy purposes is late this calendar year, late November, early December. They also have confirmed, I know some of you asked, and I thought I knew the answer, but I, I, I went back and confirmed that they will need to take out that underground line, that 50-year-old line. Their plan has been to decommission it when the new line goes online, and once it's decommissioned, take it out. So their first goal is to get it up and running again so it provides backup for the overhead. Get the new line in, and then shut that one off, decommission it, and, and remove it. Um, so a question is, can all of that happen in one right of way? Your thought that they might take it out piecemeal while putting in a new one, I'm not sure that flies if they need it to be operational until the new one's done. But that goes back to whether they could both be done in the same right of way. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be, I mean, I don't know the logistics of this, but if they could lay a new one in and then take the old one out, Very efficient and probably cost efficient as well. Yeah, I, I've been, and working with the counselors um, as well as just kind of taking my own notes on my own and from this meeting, trying to get a series of additional questions to put in front of them. Um, and one is for them to really make the case that that redundancy is needed. Because what I, what I heard at an earlier meeting was a suggestion that since that line's down and they're staging equipment during storms to try to quickly get us up and running if we were to lose electricity, is it possible to leave it down and go for the period of construction without redundancy? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm going to put that question in front of them. I guess the concern with not having, and, and then somebody else has asked, you know, is redundancy the norm? throughout the, you know, throughout the system. Does everybody have redundancy? Um, th this, this line, or these two lines, I think Dave might have an answer. Let me just finish the thought and we'll go to you. The, the, these two lines service Beverly through Rockport. So it's, it's I, think, I think they said it's roughly 50,000 customers in total. Um, so it's the whole population residentially and all the businesses of our several communities. So, um, you know, there, there, it may be that it just flat out doesn't make sense to let the line stay down for a period of time. Uh, but I think, you know, all those questions are, are deserving of answers, right? Dave? The question I have is, if they're planning on digging up all the streets of Beverly from, from the start to the finish, what's the timeline that they're saying it's going to take? Yeah. Compared to what would it take to just to dig up the side of the railroad tracks and throw another line inside there. Yeah. 
I think what we're looking at is if, if they build on the route that they're trying to, it's, a, it's, it's between an 18 and 24 month yeah. window. Yeah. It's about a year and a half to two full construction seasons. So we don't have construction <laughs> yeah. right. yeah. so Can I just Would you think, Mr. Mayor, would you think that it's a lot quicker if they went right down the rail line? Well, it's certainly shorter in terms of total distance. And, and you know, it would be an open question as to if we're able to, and it's not just convincing grid, it's MBTA and, and state officials, but if, if, if we land in a place where it goes down the rail bed, then the question is, you know, how long would that process take? Um, how would it coordinate with the, with the commuter rail? Because, you know, you, you, you don't want to lose you know, there, there's a there's a need for that service, and what would it look like, and you know how would how would it be handled? Would there be staging of trains and shut off a section of the line while it's being built and bus around? Would it be continue the train lines running, and you know maybe shut it down on weekends? Or I mean, there are a whole number of things that they've done and could try to do for, at, at various times. So I, I don't know how to answer the comparative time frames, but certainly. It's a it's a two year project. Uh, uh, let this me one. moderate just a second. I saw Han Hannah first, then Matt, then Josh. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry, and I didn't see. You. So do you want to go first? I'll go first. But I mean, my my question, hearing everybody talk about them putting up the line afterwards, is like, if we let them put it where they want, who is going to make the decisions afterwards? Like, are they really going to spend the money? You know, if we let it go, is the state making clean them up, clean up the other line? Do we end up with two problems? We'll have the, the pollution. On the rail bed and we'll have I mean, my understanding it's a requirement okay. that, that they would they would take that line out when they're done. Okay, if we could, Hannah, and then Matt, then Josh, then Eric, is that all right? <laughs> um, so, two quick questions. One is just how involved have you been in conversations with the MBTA, um, and is there a way for us to support advocacy to the MBTA to put pressure if that is a, a pressure point? My other question, and it may not be worth answering now because I don't want to divert if other questions are going in a different direction, but just an additional concern I haven't heard discussed yet is about the street work if this does go forward. And I think that is the main focus of the MOA. So seems to be something that you have spent a lot of time thinking about, and the plan in there is basically for the city to do the road work at, at the end of the day, right, and, and get paid for it. The city's track record on road work recently is the source of the largest number of complaints I hear about campaigning. Mm. So I'm just curious what the thinking was there, because as much as I hope this leads to a process where all these roads are not dug up, we'd just like to hear more about, since that is the one thing that we do have a mitigation plan for, what that what the thinking is behind that mitigation. So we had those conversations internally during that during the period of time. So what happened was initially grid was saying, you know, we're going to work on one side of the road and we're going to repave from the from the uh, side of the road to the center line. And we said, well, that makes no sense. You know, it, that, that's not going to be a good final product. It's going to be problematic if you in fact are going to dig up our roads you need to go side to side and so we kind of we fought that fight and, and they, they agreed that they would and then um, our team started saying well wait a minute how much you know what what's your price tag for this and when they showed us our team said look we we can we can get more miles done with that amount of money than, than you I think that than, than you were saying you can so why don't you write a check to us and we'll do the work? And so we, we had discussion internally about, you know, can we really get that work done? And right now we typically have up to two paving companies who we work with and up to two sidewalk companies. And what happens is they all bid work with a number of communities every year. And we try to tee up work for them and have enough work going on at any given point. You know, there, there are different. You you cold plane a street, right? You take that top level of pavement off, and then you do sidewalk work, specifically handicap ramp at intersection sidewalk work, which you need it to be down to cold plane. Then you raise the castings, 
to prepare for the paving to be done. So there, there are steps in that, in that whole road work process. And we try to have different projects in different phases so that the contractors can go from this to this to this and not leave town to go to another job. So I would say that we're, we're doing outstanding work, notwithstanding, I think, understandable frustration people have when they say, well, you raised my castings and it's been two to three weeks and I got to do the slalom again. And I get that. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a process and we've talked about planning for and making sure that we have enough contractors on retainer and doing work for us and we've got good relationships with these contractors and they prioritize our work and you know I remember probably four years ago we had a sidewalk contractor who left town on us in the middle of a job and they were you know they were telling us we'll be back we, you know we've had a problem with this or that and our engineer saw them doing a sidewalk in another community so he called them on it but we do have good relationships at present with a number of those contractors. So I think if it comes to that, we'll do a good job of managing and getting that road work done behind the behind the, uh, the grid work in a reasonable period of time. Um, I know nobody wants that. Everybody wants to, to, to change the route. So let's okay. go. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to go to Matt's question. I want to make sure we keep moving yeah, if we can. So to kind of go back to the beginning, back to what you were talking about with the other line, going overhead on the towers. What's the remaining expected life on the towers? And would they be bringing in stuff to have to replace that in the very near future as well, where if they're gonna have to do one, why not do both? Is, is there a, do you, do, does the city have a, a time frame on the overhead line? Because I know part of the urgency with the underground line is that the overhead line has been compromised for a while as well why we have the helicopter that flies over it eyeball level to check it out like once a month so do you know that the overhead line is not functioning properly because i don't i don't know that i don't know that it's not functioning properly but i know they've had issues so and like every other mechanical device it has a life yeah it, what's what's its remaining life yeah we're we, gonna have to again come down the tracks no matter what in that right. case. I know, I know we ask these questions along the way in terms of how old it is and what, it, what its expectancy is, and I just, it's not here. So let me, let me ask that again and get it for you. Um, but that's, you know, like they have no choice in that case. To, to replace the overhead line, they have to bring that stuff in. I'm just curious if the city had an answer on what the timeline for that would have been, what the remaining life of that line is. Yeah, let, let me let me get an answer to that. As I said, I know we asked that during the process. It's been a while. Okay, maybe we can go to Josh, then to Eric, and that's that's all the hands I saw for a while. Go ahead, Josh. Mike, is there a record of the conversations you had with National Grid, the reasons why they couldn't go up the existing right away, so that next week when we meet with them, we're actually first again, what the reasons were, we can research it and Attention, the things that bring out the hearing for the first time. Yeah, um, no minutes, but what what I can do is go back to the the team that met with them, which included me. It was several of us, and just try to go back through, kind of recreate the conversation and make some notes. They also presented to the city council in the early fall of 2018, which was after they presented the both the the EMF study as well as the, um, the reasons why the rail line didn't work and their, their determination that their preferred route was over land, right, or un under street. Um, we've looked at the city council meeting minutes. They're not, there's no detail there, um, but there also was a presentation they made at the council. We're trying to get that, I, I, the solicitor was looking for that document in the council clerk's office record. So, Let's see what we can recreate. Is what you're right. That's what you're asking. We'll try to get that to you folks. Everything we've got prior to Wednesday. Has, this has a sense of the criminal running the asylum. You know, they're telling us what they've decided are the limitations and restrictions, and we, you know, probably feel the frustration too. And that's ultimately we're trusting them to tell us what's possible. And I think there's a lot of intelligent people here a lot of different backgrounds and said you can do a lot of different things with some creativity 
we're not, you know, maybe they'll provide some of that next week. We'll be shocked, but we seem to be kind of in disbelief already and prepared that that's, you know, whatever they say, but we'll have to wait and see. But I, I told, I told this gentleman, John O'Brien, that that there's not much, not much faith or trust in them, and that's when they come, you know. And anyway, I'll see what I can pull together in terms of what we heard from them. Specifically, I'll try to get you something to work with before next Wednesday. Okay, okay. Eric, Eric, and then back to Karen. Yeah, it's, it's just one point sort of uh, came to me as we were talking here, and that was that, you know, if part of the argument of not going down the tracks is the coordination with the MBTA and hours of working and safety issues. But if they are in agreement to remove the existing line that is already down the tracks, it seems to me that they already have some sort of agreement to be able to, be able to work with the MBTA to get that line out in a safe manner and a timely manner too. Maybe it's multi time, but maybe that's the thing, is that it will take years and years to remove that line. But if it is in a timely manner, it might be interesting to see how that sort of plan can be leveraged to get the new line in. Um, something to think about. Because they must have some idea of what to that type of working agreement is going to be. Yes, Karen. So yeah, that's fine. So I'm, you know, I think we're all hearing from you that at the very early stages of this process, both National Grid and MBTA told you that the current configuration wasn't workable for them going forward. And I, I'm, I'm interested to know if at, at any point in time, if you're able to say, if you said, well, it doesn't work for us, so you need to go work it out. At what point in time did they say it becomes your issue, City of Beverly? Because really, it, it's not our issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it became our issue. No, that's fair. I mean, I, all I can tell you is I, I kept pushing them, saying, put it up the right of way, put it up the real bed. And at a certain point, it, it felt there were too many, there were too many obstacles to effectively practically being able to do it. So, you know, I, I, I can also tell you, I wish I, I wish now that I had kept pushing and not relented. I do. And, and you know, and, and I, I really appreciate, and, and I appreciate the email he sent me the other day. And, and I'm, I, you know, and I, I, I really do hope that there's a way to, you know, to get something accomplished together. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, so, my question was actually very similar. Um, and you'll have to forgive me because I've been running in and out. Um, but I guess I'm just concerned going forward. And this is probably going into the future too much. But I'm just concerned that they are, they just do the bare minimum of what they have to do to submit to the cities or whatnot. Um, not just for Beverly, but for every community. And I'm just wondering, um, like, how can we have them be more accountable? How can can we let them know maybe with this group that it's not okay anymore to do what they have been doing? And I don't want other neighborhoods where people can't come out because they can't spare the time or whatnot, or you know maybe not understand what they're getting into. And even if we do get the line moved to go up the railroad track, um, are they still going to have the same accountability? There's one or two houses along the line, or the environmental impact. And at that point, who would be there to, you know, I know that they're supposed to do things by the law, that they're supposed to remove the old line, but again, they take 20 years to shovel the line to it. And how would that impact the environment along the way? As well. So I'm sorry, that's kind of a mishmash. There are many different things, but. 
I think there's a lot there, and I think I think together we we try to figure that out. And I would I would lay it at their feet as well. You know, if if, if, if you want to yeah, articulate that for me on paper, I can try to I can try to pose it and. and I, I do know, and you know, I've also spoken with Secretary Theo Haridis a couple of times in the last week. That you you know, she's the State Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and you know, they 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 did they did hear, she heard, and you know, she expressed concern for the statutorily required process and it not being sufficient. You know, um, so I, th I think a lot of you pointed to that, um, and she's mindful of that as well and we're, we're going to keep talking about it i just feel like they do a lot of work in beverly and you know they're great about coming out and doing you know when we have storms and mm -hmm. helping us out but at the same time i think yeah they they just do the bare minimum of what we require and maybe we could start to require a little bit more when it comes to reports and especially communicating to communities I, I want to be I want to be sensitive to the fact that uh, many people have been here for an hour and a half or so. Alyssa, do you want to add some things to that? Yeah, so I think it's important to, so we've raised some more concerns in addition to the EMF exposure. I think um, there is, I think just to be really crystal clear, um, I'm really appreciative that you're using the we pronoun tonight. And um, that said, I do not feel that the process that has happened was sufficient, including your engagement with this. And I feel like you have come late to the game. Um, you're so much more informed tonight than you were last week. I can hear the homework you did. I know you consulted the solicitor, and I know that that was helpful in preparing the answers that you put together that you distributed ahead of time, which I really appreciate. I appreciate that you talked to Secretary Theo Herides, um, who, who um, also spoke on the record on October 8th at the EFSB hearing and put into the record along with some of the other commissioners um, the discontent they had with the process here in Beverly, including the lack of communication between your office and the city council and the fact that our city council came unprepared um, to represent us because they didn't have full information about this. So I still am, um, I do hold you accountable in some ways and I'm very, very thrilled and want to continue with the we, um, but I still want to hear a little bit more accountability right now about what we think um, are realistically the options going forward. And I want people to be really clear that the appeal process is really, really low for chances for us. Um, really low. That the MOA that we've asked the mayor to look at that he entered into an agreement on behalf of the city with National Grid might offer some off ramps and I still want to be talking about that with you because I'm not sure that we've totally finished that conversation about whether it's possible using the language in the MOA to either create more mitigation for if this goes in or to actually stop the process. Um, but to you know, come out of tonight or have a plan after tonight for being crystal clear with you about where you're going to be aligned with us, where you're not aligned or can't be aligned, and what are the options for pursuing stopping this project? What are the, what are the routes to stopping the project? That is what I think we need. That's my view of what we need tonight or what we need to get to and follow up after tonight. Uh, on the MOA, can you and I follow up with the solicitor and have a further conversation? Does that make sense to you? Um, I think it makes sense to follow up. I'm not sure that I'm the spokesperson for this group, and maybe we need to have counsel. But I think following up about the MOA is, is a great step to take together. Okay. Okay. Um, and then your question about just what are the all, what are the ways to move? I I think we're we're going to have this meeting next Wednesday. It's going to be virtual, right? And I don't know what time it is. Grid hasn't. Um, Does it have to be virtual? Is it going to be? I'm trying to. Um, 
you want me to ask them for for it oh, to be in person? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's much more. Can we can we require that they come in person? I mean, can't we set the terms and not or say that their presence is requested and it's not good cops? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that when when our third when our peer review consultant is ready, we're going to have that in person. You you folks would prefer for grid to be in person. I, I, I think I think you're right, Josh. You want to go after that for next Wednesday? Try to get them in the room? I, I think we'd try to use the senior center for all these. I think it's a little bigger space. Council chamber doesn't feel big enough and okay. ventilation. What about the new uh, public uh, access police station community room, which you could also run Zoom at the same time? Wouldn't be big enough. It only seats 50. I mean, we, we need a space that can accommodate enough people and have some distancing. And yeah. it, it, you know, that the senior center's got got good air handling as well. They don't have the Zoom capability, though, right? Uh, that's not sure. I mean, we we didn't quite get into this because we do have concerns also. But we have concerns about the peer review. Uh, I know you found somebody. Uh, talking about doing a study that's about a $2,000 study instead of a $20,000 study. Uh, I know my friend Bruce Seagan had some concern about uh, the companies that uh, he works for, which is Cambridge Environmental, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of us felt that a $2,000 study may not be as detailed as we would need it to be to actually look at it. Of course, all this would be solved if we talk right of way then we wouldn't even care about what the peer review does. But uh, I know that you, you said that this guy has great credentials, that he's not hired from within National Grid. Mm. That's all for the positive. But Bruce, what were you telling me about Cambridge Environmental earlier? Oh, it just an uh, experience of 15, 20 years ago is that they're very Pro-industry, I think, is probably the quickest way to sum up. But they're, they're a risk assessment corporation, and they have taken that to serve. Those that don't know Bruce, he's uh, an, an expert on the environment and um, these kinds of issues. So it's not, this is not a light uh, comment or a gossipy comment. It's just where did we get, um, can you, where did that name come from? Where did you get that recommendation? Yeah, so, um, we called some of the larger engineering companies, um, and they didn't have anybody. I mean, we called Weston and Sampson. Um, I think we called another one as well, and we got this name. Uh, this gentleman was with Cambridge Environmental. I think that is now defunct officially. I think he's now a CDM employee, Camp Dresser McKee. Um, we did get a name from one of the neighbors after the meeting, uh, the recent meeting, but that name was Exponent, and Exponent's who did Grid's report. We got a name of somebody else who we, we left aside because that other person, as we did some research, has done a good amount of work for... Um, Constellation. Not Constellation, one, one of the other utilities. Ever, ever, ever so. so. Um, and now this gentleman, I talked with him at some length um, earlier today, just to, you know, to, to try to vet a little better. Um, and. He has done work for both industry and communities. Um, he's working currently for the town of Needham. Um, he was, you know, very upfront about his firm did some work a number of years ago for NSTAR. Um, but in, in talking with him, he seems very, you know, very thoughtful, very measured, very neutral, very objective. Um, I, I invite. I, I forwarded the proposal he gave us, which yeah. we agreed to. So you can you can certainly Google and look him up. Um, and we did we did distribute that to the people in yeah. the Google group. Yeah. And I also talked with Tim earlier, and I and I also uh, expressed to Mr. Um, it's Mr. Lester, right? Which Lester? Um, that um, that if you folks thought that there was additional scope beyond what he proposed, that should be looked at. That you know, I told him. I said, you know, it's you're right. It's, he proposed two thousand dollars. I talked to him and said, well, we're definitely going to need you to come and meet with the neighbors, meet with the community, and present. And any additional scope that makes sense, we'll want to do. Um, 
So if there's something that you folks see lacking in, in the proposal, please bring it up. You know, we'll bring it to him. If it makes sense to add in, we'll do it. Um, oh, and, and the last piece is we decided, you know, I don't know where that 20,000 number came from. I don't remember. It was, it was certainly discussed and debated back during the MOA process. We just decided to leave aside GRID's role here and not look to them to pay for this uh, review so as to not get entangled with that. So, you know, whatever the final price tag is on the review, we'll be paying for it with city funds. So. Why wasn't the study done earlier? Um, well, frankly, the, the MOA wasn't, um, wasn't finalized until late March of 2020. And we were we were shut down and we were in COVID, so I'm not defending that it wasn't done. We should have done it, um, but I'm in terms of practicality, it 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 slipped, you know. But not you know nothing has gone into the ground yet, and it's being done now. And you know, we'll see what it shows. I mean, I you know, when I was talking with him today, I said you know we we just want the truth to out here. And he was quick to say, you know, that that's his goal. It's his goal with every, you know, with, with all the work he does. So, yes. Well, um, are we? Is this unique, or are there power lines like this in other neighborhoods on city streets the, of the same dimension? Yeah, no. I mean, it's not unique. It's it's not unique. But there are transmission lines. Uh, we asked them. We got a number. There are certain number of miles of transmission lines in the state that run under street, run under streets. Um, uh, the EMF concern comes up a lot. And, you know, we know that. We all know that. Um, so, yeah. One thing I'll say about that, Bob, is, and Mac, is um, um, the, there's been a lot of history, and we're starting to research it, a uh, precedent of cities fighting back and the city officials or the mayor um, suing you know, to stop it. So one thing that's unusual here is that we're so far along without that happening. And that's why I'm really grateful that we're starting to talk about this. I think it would be really great to try to, to really try to stop it now and use whatever resources we have to do that. Um, and I, even if it, I would, I would ask that even if it's an uphill battle, um, I'd like to go for it, and I'd like to invite you to do it with us. And I think you're, you've are you seen that we will do it anyway, <laughs> but it'd be great to have you on board, um, even if it means, as you already have a little, taking some hits on you know things that didn't work before, um, maybe rebuilding some trust. Um, you know, I think it felt like the, the, the consultant hires just materialized right after there was some pushback and then it might have happened after a call with National Grid. So just to be really transparent, I think there's a lot of people who feel not trusting, not just of National Grid, but also, you know, of the city officials. And that's really awful. And I really want to, it would be, you know, in a time where I think a lot of us are feeling pretty disenfranchised, it would be great if we could work together in solidarity to change the trajectory of this project and um, put it in a place where it's going to affect the least people, the least, ha cause the least harm, regardless of cost. But I do think that it's actually less expensive. So I think there's a lot to be gained by working together. <coughs> and I think if we can figure out some next steps that are very clear tonight, where you're, where you're saying, I will do A and B and C, that will go a long way toward having people feel um, like we're making like there's a little bit more trust and like we're you know seeing the pathway to what's going to happen next rather than just raising concerns which is very cathartic but it doesn't materialize into accountable action and i really think that what we need now is accountable action what do you think are the right next steps so I invite, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about this in the group, and I really want to invite people that, to add to this, but I think having a much more robust, independently funded um, consultant come in and do the EMF study is critical. I think that, I don't remember who made this point, maybe, maybe it was Tim, that 
that is not, I'm worried that that will be used against us. That, because we already kind of know what that study is going to say. I, National Grid is using the same study everywhere, and it's been vetted by their attorneys and by all their people. Yeah. And it's going to say that we have a correlation between childhood leukemia and these high voltage lines, but no causation. And when you have no standard, you can use that against a community and put something in. And so I want to recognize that that's a very, well, that's like a, a false, that's like a pyrrhic victory. If we wind up getting a great a study that says it's it's on, it's basically, we're going to get a study that at its best is going to say inconclusory. And I think that's going to, that could be a noose around our neck. So I guess I want to be working with you to then proactively think to the next thing and play like a chess player and say, where does the city really want to be with this? Does it want to be setting a precedent that National Grid can come in and lay down this, this shit in our yards whenever it wants to because it doesn't have a standard and because there's an inconclusory causal, causal link? Let's be smart. Let's like figure out if we have any kind of procedural or legal um, back pocket at this point. And I would say to you, take the risk and be a little bit more controversial and do it late. And it sucks, you know, they're gonna say, hey, you hey, you were, you testified at the hearing on October 8th to, to put the shovel in, Mr. Mayor. What are you doing now? Well, you didn't know that your citizen, that the residents were this concerned and you're responding to them. And we're giving you cover by, I hope you see that we are giving you cover to then make that argument now more forcefully. That's what I really want to do. Figure out how to forcefully make the argument, make our best case. Can we have an injunction? Can we have a due process violation? Can we have a written mandamus and get ourselves in there, even if we're not an intervener? I think there are, I think having the solicitor work a little harder and maybe partnering with another attorney would be the answer. I want you to put it all out there. That's what I really Pretty want. Pretty soon you're going to have 100 plus signs lining the street and you're going to have number of people who sign a petition, you're going to have a lot of other people to be able to point to and say, look at my citizens, they're really angry, they really want to see this change. You know, and I have a question for you um, that has to do with, when you go back to that time when you were hearing National Grid present about the right of way, and you were saying to yourself, geez, this is really not the right solution. You, know, you were thinking internally, this is really not the right solution, but they're telling me this is the way it is. Do you wish, is there anything at that point in time you wish you had as a resource to be able to help you make the argument, to persuade, to be convincing? Because that's what we can help you with too. I mean, that's how we can do this. And I, the question is, I don't know if you have an answer to that, but. Well, I think the point is we're offering to help you to move this in the right direction. We, we would like to be thought of as the thorn that you can point to in your side to tell them that you know you this this is not going and that it's going to become uh, a, it's a major major problem for for national grid uh, and and for the city if we do that and you know those signs are not going to just stay in my backyard uh, even though I've got a free aeration tonight which is great uh, but they're they're going to they're going to be around but those those signs are signs asking to stop that project and to do the right thing. And, and I'm hoping that you're, you're looking at this group and saying, this group is uh, giving me the argument that I need to be able to make. So, yeah, thank you, Tim. And Jim, Melissa, back to what you just said. It does not sound unreasonable, the steps you're outlining. So. I mean, I'm, I'm leaning that way anyway, so let's keep talking and, and try to... Um, yeah, I mean, my, my goal is that, that they are going to see the wisdom in coming to the table and working this with us. That's my goal right now. You can whisper in our ear and tell us what we need to say, and we promise we'll say words. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we'll turn the camera off uh, over there. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, my... I, I, what do you see as a step to get that for the um, I think they recognize that, you know, they, they were, everything, everything for a little period of time was focused on 
getting some work done before the end of the construction season, the calendar year. I think they're seeing that that's less likely now, as as you know, as they're a acknowledging the need to pause and work through this, and b recognizing that where they wouldn't have in, they wouldn't have anticipated this, there's a very real possibility that they would be denied at the city council to get their grant of location. So I think the pieces are moving, and I think we can, you know, we can, my, my goal really is, is for GRID to become, you know, to come to the table genuinely on this. And the city can act in unison, and we can turn the camera off. Um, I don't mean this in a moment, but I think we can do that, and we can really think about what is the city's best interest, which includes residents and growth and all the things that you have to balance as well. I think everybody has been thinking about what you're up against too and how complicated this is and trying to figure out a way for you to be able to push back against National Grid here. So that's what I would say next steps are, are being very, very strategic about our limited, we have a very limited amount of options right now, just realistically. Um, I'd rather be plotting those options out together and again, recognizing that there might be places of non-alignment. You mentioned the, the role of the council, and um, I think you said earlier that National Grid would have to come and make their petition to, to them, yeah. um, as they usually do. But is there a mechanism that you could go before the council and ask them what their position is on this, and you could present a letter to National Grid saying, you know, the council has already indicated that they are disinclined to support this. So let's not spin our wheels continuing to try to go down that path. Let's go back and revisit the right of way in the rail bed. All of that is contingent upon the city council's not having somehow already approved it which at least in one email from one of our uh, friends who's a city employee, the police think that it's all been signed, already been signed away by the city council. Although the city councilors that are now in position, they have no awareness of ever having done that. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I said I'd look into that. It, it just, it sounds, it doesn't sound like that's what has happened. Okay. But, so to, to your point, uh, Karen, I mean, I can do that. I don't know that I need to. I think the council, maybe the councilors, I think, are predisposed there anyway. Um, we don't know because right. we understand that um, an actual question hasn't been presented to the council yeah. and they can't um, speak about this uh, in violation of open meeting. So it's, oh, not, I got really, you. Yeah. it's yeah. not really clear where they are. Can you and I follow up? I mean, it, it, procedurally, it, it, it might be an easy enough matter to just go and have a discussion with them, me go and have a discussion with them. Um, and then it's, in, then it's in a posted public meeting and they can discuss it, you know, very publicly in, 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 in detail. But do you think if you had something from the council essentially saying, we're not going to support putting mm -hmm. this in the street, would that be helpful to you in, in your... Uh, explanation to National Grid. It would it would make sense. It would be. Yeah. I mean, I think they already. I think Grid already has that understanding that they don't. You know, the 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 city is not. The city council is not inclined to support what they're trying to do. But if it if it's at all unclear, but let me let me check on that. If it's it all unclear. Likely too, the National Grid would still push ahead um, if they had signed it away and still wanted to do this with the pushback. I, I mean, it's, it's possible, and I think we want to be conservative, but it seems unlikely. Okay. I think we're we're beginning to lose some of some some of the people, uh, but I don't want people to walk away dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. I'm just wondering, the Arcadio, whether it would help you if you said that you have discovered new information which was not there originally, 
like there are some residents on the line with medical devices that are incompatible, which was not there. And I had another gentleman talk about light bulbs that are incompatible. Maybe that information was not there initially. Mm -hmm. I think all, all the all the issues of EMFs and other types of impacts have all been in the public sphere before. I think Alyssa pointed to that. Um, I, I think what if if there's a if there's a new hook there, as you're asking about Esther, it's that. Well, both grid and then and then that, that other meeting at Code Community we've since learned was the EFSB, right? Yeah. Um, and it's become very clear very recently, right? To me, anyway, and I think to all to all of you that well, required steps were followed on notice. I'm not sure what the right term is. Is it constructive notice or is it, it, it um, kind of practical or actual notice? That's where that's where that expression that the process was deficient and didn't serve its 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 stated goal. So I think if there's anything, it's it's that. Um, we we have the, a few hooks that I think we could feed you on, which are not quite what Esther said, but the same yeah. idea. Yeah. And they, yeah, I mean, Katie, I'm sure, uh, Secretary Theo Herides, I'm sure, uh, she put in, she noticed it. Yeah. She put it in the record. They were aware. I mean, Conservation Law Foundation sued them like maybe a year and a half, two years ago, mm -hmm. um, on process deficiencies related uh, to access for language. And they now have, even though CLF lost the suit, the EFSB now has language access. And they had it at the meeting mm -hmm. on October 8th. They care about that. It was a spotlight issue for them. And they're on the watch. I don't. You know, so that's an angle. I don't know how successful it would be, but it's an angle. Um, certainly, the pandemic changes the traditional, you know, that might be novel, but there's really nothing to compare that to. Right. And we can make the argument that regular notice and comment isn't sufficient, and we don't really have anything to compare that to. Um, the other hook might be um, the perimeter that she mentioned, flooding the substation. She was very worried about that. I think we might, there might be some other ways to raise things, and also just the fact that you have, as somebody said, the thorn in your side, like that just wasn't true before. And you are, you are an elected official and you are responding to that, and you have to do that. And it's a course of business for you to do that. So I think it makes your being reasonable and your role to push back in a different way now. Yeah. And I think that that is a possibility for pursuit. One other thing about the, no the notice, um, which I, jumps out at, at me is that um, there's a high percentage of red, uh, dwelling units along or abutters along the route uh, that are not owner occupied properties. And so the notice, I believe, goes to the owner of record, not the people who are living there. Is that correct? Do you know? I'm yeah. not sure. So um, that seems in and of itself a defect in, in notice. Um, I, I don't, you know, well, I, and Also given the length of the process, right. there are many, many new uh, abutters that right. didn't get the initial, uh, you know I, know, I know I was not really aware of it and it was, uh, the, the winter of 2019 was the time had, when I was completely distracted yeah. with other things going on. If I'm not so mistaken, I they included things in their mailers with the bills. Yeah. But I, I think I think both Karen and, and Alyssa are, are, as you said, you, you've got gets their bill rationale bill. and arguments that we can use. And I agree. That makes sense to me. Um, I, I do want to say thank you to everybody who came here tonight and uh, Mr. Mayor, thank two you. hours of your time on a couple of days notice is a very responsive and, and I appreciate this uh, newfound uh, you know, willingness to come and, and meet on this. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we, can, we can move forward together uh, and, and get this reconsidered. 
Uh, is there more that we should be saying right now, anybody? Tim, what's the process for getting a sign? Take, take it. One take it. Yeah. <laughs> take it. Yeah. Yeah. Take it to you. Yeah. If you have someone else that you know will be putting it in, let's not waste them. But we didn't buy 400 signs for nothing, and let's let's get them out. Uh, so people, please do take your chairs, take a sign if you're inclined to do that. Uh, we'll certainly be letting people know where they can come and pick them up. I'm probably going to leave them there for a few days, let people know they can come down and pick them up in the yard. So uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Sure. You say in terms of next steps, it sounds like we didn't resolve the question about when National Grid is meeting and whether it's a Zoom meeting or in person. Yeah. We believe it's the 26th. No, 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 no 27th. 27. Okay. Uh, they're intending a Zoom meeting. Okay. I'm going to reach out tomorrow morning and tell Great. them the neighborhood wants it to meet in person. Excellent. I'll, I'll let Tim know what I get back on that. And the other action item? If they would move to delay the... Yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other action item I think that everybody can do, what I'm hearing tonight too, is write to the councilmen, council people, and let them know that they need to essentially not grant that approval. The, that allows them to dig in the streets right away. Um, that's number one. Number two is getting the, the meeting established with the grid uh, and being prepared for that. So we have questions for that. Those are some things that I thought of. And we do have sign up sign-in sheets here. People who have been here could sign in with that information so that we can communicate with you. And the only other thing that I would um, ask is this has been a grassroots effort, um, people reaching out to their friends and neighbors, and we're hoping that you will continue that effort and reach out to your friends and neighbors and make them aware. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, I think